Hi, I'm Mike Siegel, and I am not the Kwisatz Haderach, but I am an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So I have been a fan of Dune for a very long time. I've read the books, I've liked the Lynch movie, I like the sci-fi TV series, and I really enjoyed the new movie. And I've written a review of the movie just as a movie for Ordinary Times, which you can check out at the link below. But I thought I'd actually do a little video on the science of Dune and how it strikes me as an astronomer and as a scientist. So let's jump in. The main subject of the movie is the planet Arrakis, also known as Dune. That's why it's called Dune. Almost all the action takes place on Arrakis and the planet, its environment, its culture, its place in the Imperium are center stage to the plot. One of the pet peeves of astronomers, and indeed science fiction fans in general, is when planets are portrayed as having one environment or one culture. You know, if you just consider one planet, Earth, we have a massive variety of environments from pole to pole and a huge broad array of cultures from meridian to meridian. Sure, you might see the occasional planet that has one environment because of particular circumstances, but every planet? Why are they all ocean planets or desert planets or forest planets? It just doesn't really seem realistic. But in this particular case, a desert planet isn't that unrealistic. There have been theoretical papers recently which have looked at what extrasolar planets might be like in terms of their environment, and they speculate that desert planets might actually exist. In fact, the Earth might one day become a desert planet. As the sun ages, it's getting brighter and brighter, and in a few billion years, the Earth might not be an ocean planet anymore. It might be a desert planet. But we actually don't have to think about this in theoretical terms. We can think about this in very concrete terms because we know about a desert planet. We call it Mars. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but not too much. Mars is extremely arid and has long stretches of desert and very large mountains, very similar to Arrakis. Also like Arrakis, Mars may have been very different in the past. Our space probes that have landed on Mars have indicated that early in its history, Mars was much warmer and had flowing water and may have had the conditions that allowed life to at least have some kind of beginning, if not evolve into the kind of sophisticated creatures we see on Earth. It may have been very different in the past. Now, since that time, Mars has lost its atmosphere, it's dried out, and has become lifeless. But it has still a lot of similarities to the fictional Arrakis. Mars, of course, doesn't just have one environment. It's not just one vast desert. There's enormous variation. It has gigantic planet-spanning canyons and enormous volcanic shields that are the size of countries and giant frozen lakes. At the poles, you get these ice caps that form in the summer months that are frozen water and carbon dioxide. While at the equator, it can get up to 95 degrees. Well, 95 degrees. When I say 95 degrees, you'd still freeze if you set foot on Mars. This is one of those times when the way that physicists think about temperature and the way most people think about temperature kind of diverge. To a physicist, temperature means how fast molecules are moving in the air. Now, if you're in an area where there are a lot of those molecules, such as the thick atmosphere of Earth, a lot of those molecules are hitting your body, they're imparting energy to your body, warming it up, and so that's why you perceive the air to be warm. Somewhere like Mars, though, the atmosphere is very thin, so very few of those particles are striking your body. So even though any individual molecule of air is moving very fast, so few of them are hitting you that you would actually be very cold on the surface of Mars. But you can see it does have a lot of variation. It's not just one big glop of planet. But the nice thing about Dune is that Arrakis also has a complex environment. They don't talk about it as much in the movies, but the city of Arrakeen is in the North Polar Cap, about 60 degrees north longitude, or about the longitude of Juneau, Alaska. And as you move further south from that city, the desert gets warmer and harsher and hotter until it gets so hot and so harsh that only the Fremen can survive. And that's actually quite a nice touch in terms of realism of making this like an actual desert planet where the poles would be cooler and the equator would be warmer. Now, Arrakis actually doesn't have seasons. The extended lore says that Arrakis is actually 90 degrees to its sun. Earth is tilted 23 degrees. That's why we have seasons. Because of that tilt of the Earth, the sun is much further overhead, which makes it warmer, and at other times it's lower on the horizon, which makes it cooler. Because you don't get that tilt with Arrakis, the, uh, the sun is always at the same height. They do get something wrong in that the sun should never be overhead in Arrakeen. Because uh, it is further north, the sun should never get more than 30 degrees above the horizon, so it should be quite low and the shadows quite long in most of the scenes. 
but I can understand why they did it the way they did. Another similarity, Dune has these massive, terrifying dust storms, which they call Coriolis storms. We actually get Coriolis storms on Earth. We call them hurricanes. The Coriolis effect is a twisting motion that applies to systems moving on a rotating object. If you imagine a massive hurricane that's hundreds of miles across, uh, the part that's closer to the equator will be moving a little faster than the part that's further away. That causes it to twist and what causes that circulation pattern in the hurricane. Now, you may have heard of the Coriolis effect before. It's claimed that this is why the water in your toilet flows one way or the other, depending on whether you're north or south of the equator. It never spins the other way. In the northern hemisphere, water always drains counterclockwise. It's called the Coriolis effect. That's not actually true unless your toilet is 100 miles across. The Coriolis effect is a much more gentle effect, so you need a much larger system to see it. But we do get the Coriolis effect on vast scale, so you would get these on Arrakis too. What's more, Going back to Mars, Mars has dust storms. These dust storms can be so massive that they cover almost the entire surface of the planet. Now, they don't have the destructive power that you see in the movie, either the Dune movie or in the movie The Martian, which I might talk about at some other point. Mars's atmosphere is too thin, but they can actually have kind of powerful effects. In 2004, we found that the solar power being fed into our Spirit and Opportunity rovers suddenly jumped overnight. It had been going gradually down, and then overnight it suddenly jumped up a few percent. And what they think happened was that a small dust storm came in and swept all the accumulated dust off of the solar panels, allowing them to accumulate more solar energy. And that was one of the reasons those probes lasted way longer than we had anticipated, because periodically a wind, powerful wind or a dust storm would clean off those solar panels and they would continue to function. So the storms that occur on Dune that we see in the movie and in the TV show cross me as entirely realistic. If you had a Mars type environment and you had a much thicker atmosphere like they do on Arrakis, having a massive, essentially dust hurricane is something that I could absolutely see happening and is, uh, I think, a very realistic uh, portrayal, especially for a book that was written before we had even landed probes on Mars and knew anything about its surface. Now, we have not seen giant sandworms on Mars, unfortunately. I have always been a bit skeptical of those, how they get to be so big, only feeding on the occasional harvester. And we do know of creatures that can actually swim through sand, but they tend to be small. A bigger creature has a lot more friction, and so it'd be much harder to move, take a lot more energy. But you know, who knows? If Mars had not dried out and become inhospitable to life, who knows what would have evolved there? Life finds a way. Now, there is one astronomy aspect of the planet Dune that isn't realistic, and that is its two moons. The idea that it has two moons is realistic. Earth has one moon, but we actually have a lot of these little tiny pseudo-moons that sort of circle around the Earth, little tiny asteroids that are in orbit around us. Mars itself has two moons, but those are actually captured asteroids, so they're not big moons like ours. So the idea that Dune would have two moons is not unrealistic, but the configuration is. In the movies, they are portrayed as very close to each other on the sky, and this would really not happen. You could have them at each other's Trojan points, like I talked about in the Twin Dilemma video, where they were uh, far from each other. You could also have where one is tidally locked to Arrakis' rotation and the other is in a much more distant orbit, also tidally locked, like you have with some of the Jovian moons. But having them like really close to each other, like they show in the movie, that's probably not going to happen. When you have three bodies interacting gravitationally, there are only a handful of configurations that are stable. In any other configuration, they will interact in such a way that you will eventually kick one of them out of the system or kick it into the surface of Dune. So you, there are only a few configurations where you would have a stable system with a planet and two large moons, and having them right next to each other is not one of them. Another thing that's a little unrealistic, at one point, Duncan Idaho gives Paul a little device that he calls a paracompass, which is supposed to help him navigate on the surface of Dune, and he says that this is to account for the magnetic field of the moon. This is very unrealistic. Uh, the, we have studied dozens of moons in our solar system, and only Ganymede, of all those systems, has a magnetic field. The reason is that you need a molten core inside a body to have a magnetic field. That creates that convective flow where electrical and magnetic energy can flow and create that larger magnetic field. The Earth has a magnetic field because we have a molten core. Mars does not because its core has cooled off. The Moon does not because its core has also solidified. These two small moons 
will almost certainly have cold cores and so will not have magnetic fields. With Ganymede, it's actually pretty close to Jupiter, so Jupiter's tidal gravity needs the core of the moon, but Jupiter is very massive, Ganymede is very close, that wouldn't happen in a system like this. So that is also unrealistic. But overall, this is a really great portrayal of what a desert planet would actually look like. It is a complex environment that varies over the surface of the planet. The inhabitants have adapted to that in very realistic ways. When we see the desert, it's not a barren waste, but is an actual ecosystem with creatures and plants that have adapted to live there. I wish more films invested in this kind of effort into the world building part of their world building, because it's refreshing to see an actual realized planet in a science fiction movie. Now, once we move past the planetary ecology, the books and the film become a lot more fanciful. I've talked about faster than light travel in my 2001 video. In the Dune universe, they overcome the light barrier by folding space. That is taking the space near, say, Arrakis and the space near Caladan and, and folding the universe until they are next to each other so you can easily travel. This is actually fairly common in science fiction. It also features in A Wrinkle in Time. It's actually crossed me as one of the more unrealistic ways of breaking the light barrier because in order to fold the space near Arrakis from Caladan, you need to send some kind of signal to manipulate space and that can't move faster than the speed of light. So it would actually take you as long to fold that space as it would to just travel there near the speed of light. The movie also deals with psychic and superhuman abilities, most notably the voice, which acts like a kind of hypnosis and makes people obey your commands. While this isn't really my area of expertise, we've never identified psychic powers or even a part of the human brain that could provide psychic powers. And hypnosis, like the voice, is not an actual thing. Most scientists think that this is just a parlor trick and it's just a, a sort of suggestion that, that people are susceptible to. Paul's visions of the future. In the book, they're actually not really psychic. They seem to be more mathematical. This isn't mentioned in the new movie, but Paul is actually trained as a Mentat, as a human computer. And so it's more of him being able to project the future, kind of like in Isaac Asimov's books, based on what he knows. I'm kind of dubious of that because we've been working on that for decades and can't even predict elections. So predicting a galaxy-wide jihad crosses me as a leap. And there are limits to how fast humans can move and the kind of interactions they can have. But I'm also aware that many of the feats we take for granted these days, like running a mile in three minutes and 43 seconds, would seem superhuman to our forebears. So while it's unrealistic, it's not banging my head on the table unrealistic. It crosses me as a reasonable flight of fancy. The other flight of fancy that I wanted to talk about, though, is actually not that far-fetched, and that is the spice melange itself. We are told that the spice enhances consciousness and extends life. And a lot of that is based on 1960s thinking where people experimented with things like LSD and thought it expanded your mind and blah, 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 blah. I actually don't think that the idea of something like the spice is crazy. Let's take the geriatric effects. Pharmaceutical companies are working right now to devise drugs that will extend life and slow aging. I've in fact written a novel about it, available cheap at the link below about the idea of drugs that extend life and what that would mean for human beings. And expanding consciousness, well, we have drugs that will help you focus your attention, that will help you deal with anxiety, that will help you concentrate and stay alert despite not getting sleep. So this actually, the effects of the spice don't cross me as that unreasonable that you could develop something like this. Now it does occur naturally on the surface of Arrakis. That seems unlikely. But think about it for a minute. If you have a galaxy-spanning empire, there are tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions of inhabitable planets in your empire. Even if something like the spice evolving naturally were extremely unlikely, you get to roll the dice a hundred billion times to see if it can happen. And so having a universe spanning empire like this, it seems like something like this is not that far fetched. Again, it's fanciful, but it's not banging my head on the desk fanciful. It crosses me as a reasonable fantasy, given what we know about science, given what we know about human beings, and given what we know about the universe. And again, being able to see this in the 1960s before the space program had really gotten going is quite extraordinary. So overall, I think Dune holds up reasonably well from a scientific perspective. It has some flights of fancy, faster than light travel, psychic abilities, giant sandworms, but that's more than made up for by the attention paid to Arrakis itself. 
This is one of the few alien planets we've seen in science fiction movies that feels like an actual place where someone did the homework and thought about what this place would be like and how humans would adapt to it. Granted, the, the book does this a lot more thoroughly than the movies, although the sci-fi TV series, because it had a more limited budget, spent a lot more time on this sort of thing. So I do recommend watching it if you didn't enjoy Dune. But even though the movies had to truncate a lot of that detail on Arrakis, they didn't just let it be another generic sci-fi desert planet. We are still given some hints of the culture, some hints of the ecology, some hints of the environment, and some hints that this is actually a realistic place that human beings might explore millions of years into the future. There's a reason that people like this book and a reason it has been so influential on science fiction. And hopefully one of these days, I'll talk about another movie that was highly influenced by Dune and talk about the things it got right and the things it got wrong. Until then, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching.